things that I am extremely passionate about, not including my fiance, how the human body moves, and what moves us as humans. The what moves us portion is a whole other talk. That's purpose, higher purpose, getting your needs met, all of those things. But the how we accomplish those things, how we actually move through space, that is what I'll talk about today. So movement itself. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came down the road to being really passionate about movement. And then I'll get into the why, how, what of movement. Why is movement important? How are we designed to actually move through space? And what can we be doing every day to really not only take our design and fit it into our environment, but actually take our environment and fit it into our design. So, so why, or I guess how I, or why I started into movement itself was um, kind of a slow trickle over the last few years, probably five years ago or so, I was the head athletic trainer for USA Water Polo, and I had this wonderful mentor, Karen Block, she's just a brainiac. And she wanted to do a QFCE, or Qualitative Functional Capacity Evaluation, on hundreds of youth water polo athletes in the country. So we traveled to the USA Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs and just sat there for eight hours a day watching little kids move, not in a weird way, but like a productive, <laughs> scoring them way. And that is the day that I just started to view the human body in a much different way, seeing that more for this wholeness picture that we were talking about earlier, seeing the chains of the body connect and where there might be spots that are not integrating into the whole. So that was the first. I really wanted to follow her path. She had gone to chiropractic school as a performance director at USA Water Polo, and I watched her just blossom into this incredible professional. So I wanted to do something very similar. So I went to chiropractic school, and a quarter in, I was yanked out, and I got to go to China as a member of Athletes Performance, which is a really high-level sports performance company, and I got to train with the Olympic judo team. So in China, I had another aha moment. Not, I worked with FMS, which is another uh, information, like fundamental movement screen that you can do to score objectively people's movements. And using that was fun. It wasn't completely mind-blowing because I've already done the QFCE. But the mind-blowing part was two weeks, three weeks before I went to China, I had a massive ankle sprain. And I was expected to perform while I was there, so I was really worried about it. So I was doing a lot of squatting. I was like, oh, I can't do this stuff, whatever. I got it to where I could at least function a little bit. But one thing I still had a hard time doing was squatting really deep. And if you've never been to China, the toilets there require you to squat really deep. And so one of the aha moments was the fact that when I went to go number two, I could not do this. So I had to try to do this weird like thing like this. And that led me to, you know, the need to create change and I had to seek out another option. And luckily, the aha moment was there was a Western toilet in almost every bathroom in China. And it was in the handicap stall. So how we take a number two here is how handicapped Chinese people take <laughs> And that made a huge light bulb go on to where it was like, okay, I might be culturally limited in how much I can actually understand the human frame and the function. So this is when I came back, I was on a mission to just seek out as much information about actual movement, not just the anatomy, not just the physiology, but how are we moving through space? Why is a desk shaped this way? Why isn't it shaped more like this? And why don't we put our knees forward instead of right back or whatnot? Paul Walton is kind of a guru when it comes to the human body, so I hung around him for a long time. He introduced me to the book Anatomy Trains. Okay, and now we're starting to get more into the why of human movement. So before I get to the anatomy train, that's more of the how. The why is really the, the research that has supported the importance of movement. Daniel Wolpert kind of has the funnest thing that I've heard. He's a neuroscientist, MD, engineer. He has a really popular TED talk on motor control. And it's, a, I mean, it's dense stuff information-wise. But there's a couple of golden gems. And I'm going to try to drop those right here. He says there is only one function of the human brain. And that is adaptive and complex movement. That's it. He gives an example in nature of this little squirmy animal thing on the bottom of the ocean called the sea squirt. 
and it cruises around in its infancy, and then it finds a food source, and it plants itself onto a rock. And it has a brain and a nervous system until it plants itself on the rock. And it doesn't have to move anymore, so it digests its own brain and nervous system. And I once watched all three Lord of the Rings back to back. <laughs> and I had to really feel like what that little guy goes through. <laughs> so, um, the second influential piece of research for me has been Joan Vernikos. She is the former director of life sciences for NASA. And she was responsible for monitoring the health of the astronauts before and after they went to space. And then she would see what were the damages from being in an anti gravity environment. What can we do to counteract that? And she has gone on to say that she wrote a book called Sitting Kills, Movement Heals. And her kind of the takeaway phrase from the talk that I watched from her was the key to lifelong health is not the typical traditional go to the gym once a day, three to five times a week, but consistent, low intensity, non exercise movement. She did a study to see what was more beneficial. Standing, sitting, or going from sitting to standing. And she said it wasn't the standing that was most healthy, as opposed to the sitting. It was the actual standing up. The action of using the gravitational forces that are there from the moment you're born to the moment you die, that form you into the shape that you are. Using those forces to become what you're meant to be. Standing moving, being dynamic through space. Vernikos was really influential in a system I'll talk about in a moment called foundation training. And that's again more of the how. The last piece of the why, for why movement is so important, came when I wrote an article for the uh, Lifelines called Sitting is the New Smoking. And it was um, inspired by an interview of Anoop Kanodia, who's an MD researcher in, at Ohio State University. And he was competing. He cited another research study that compared sitters and smokers. I think it was the British Journal of Sports Medicine, October 2012. And he, they looked at life expectancy for smokers. And it's not that surprising. Like, they averaged that every cigarette they smoked took 11 minutes off their life compared to a non-smoker. Then they looked at the sitters. And this was the crazy part. Because every hour of television that they sat and watched took 22 minutes off of their life. So I have this like grudge against Lord of the Rings for even existing. <laughs> it's, like, it's like four hours of quality like grandchildren time, you know, when I'm like 140. <laughs> so these is like these are the whys that kind of have fueled me to get more into the research, to get into what is the cutting edge now. And the things that I've found currently, Anatomy Trains, the book itself, has been really influential just looking at how the body is designed. You know, we, we learn compartmentalization when in the anatomy classes we break the body up into all these pieces. But if you look at how the body is actually supposed to function, you have a person, okay, and I'll just do that one again. He's facing that way. If you look at how the body is actually designed, we learn the lower extremity. Okay, so there's the bottom of the foot, there's the calf, there's the hamstring, okay? Then we learn about the hips and the low back. We have sacrotuberous ligaments, sacral fascia, iliocostalis, paraspinals. Then we have the cervical spine and the head, even two separate classes. Suboccipital muscles, epicranial fascia, aponeurosis. But what they don't really talk about too much in where's that class that ties it all in together, the interconnectedness, is that these fascias actually interweave and they have intersecting areas where they connect. So if I take this guy's head and bend it down this way, that's actually gonna tighten the entire fascia. So in the book Anatomy Trains, they call them trains. In foundation training, where they actually take that concept into a practical application, they call them muscle chains. And I tend to call them musculotendinofascial chains because it just makes more sense to me. So being able to hinge in this pattern, not allowing us, when you get into your desk, people typically, when I watch them, bend at the knees first and then let gravity just kind of like body slam them into their chair. Instead of that, use kind of 
uh, Vernicos method of allowing gravity to be a part of the process, but not just letting it take over, and shifting the gravitational forces from the passive system, your ligaments and your bones absorbing all the forces, into more of the active system, the muscles, the tendons, and take the forces, distribute those along each of the muscle chains. When you're sitting and standing, that would be mostly the posterior chain. You could influence some of the spiral chains or the lateral if you're moving laterally. But getting the active system to participate is really what's going to help us live a life, like a life of health and comfort. I'm going to do one exercise with you guys, just the what of movement. So something you can be doing as you sit in your chair each day, and I'll do it with you. We're just going to do what's called decompression, and we'll anchor along with it. So, if you're sitting here, you can keep your desk down or up either way. But I want you to plant your feet firmly in the ground. Have them just past 90 degrees, so open your legs a little bit more. I want you to, from here, very lightly squeeze your knees toward each other. They don't have to actually be together and like, in as hard as they can. Just lightly squeeze in and then lightly squeeze your feet toward each other, just a little bit. So you're going to feel your adductors kick on. The adductors connect to the pubic bone. A lot of things connect to the pubic bone superiorly, one of them including external and internal obliques. When those connect in, those also connect up to the bottom three ribs. That's where your lat attaches. So now you're connecting your lower body to your upper body. Lightly anchoring in. Now I want you to just put your hands here, pinkies on your ASIS, thumbs on your ribs. And take a deep breath in and expand your ribs as high as you possibly can. Hold that breath in. As you exhale, don't let your ribs drop. Actually pull your belly into your spine. From here, tuck your chin very lightly. Elongate your suboccipital muscles. Take another deep breath in. And relax. So you just pushed the reset button. You can do that any time during the day. If you actually sit there and hold it, you can be training during class. <laughs> or you can just have a moment where you're like, oh, man, I can't necessarily get up right now, but I can do this and feel better. Come back to your breath, come back to your body, connect yourself, interconnect yourself, and enjoy your day. Thanks, guys. <laughs>